Good evening. I don't know. Can you hear me? I guess so, right? Okay. Uh, John has asked that I remind you of two things. The first is those who are uncomfortable that there is an overflow space set up downstairs with chairs. And secondly, um, that after tonight's lecture, there is a reception for Alejandro downstairs. So before you disappear, uh, please uh, take a moment to have a glass of wine and speak with him. So um, uh, it's great to see such a big crowd. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce tonight's lecturer, Alejandro Zerapolo, who's an architect, educator, and without a doubt, one of the most important contributors to contemporary architectures conceptualization and production. A native of Spain, he studied architecture initially in Madrid, followed by graduate work at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. And after a brief collaboration with Ram Kohlhaus, he established Foreign Office Architects with Farshid Mousavi in 1995. Uh, developing and realizing the project that many of us associate with early Foreign Office work, the award-winning Yokohama International Cruise Terminal, from 1995 to 2002, foreign office are currently building internationally an office complex in London, an institute of legal medicine in Spain, residences for artists and researchers in France, several high-rise residential towers in Korea, and thankfully, a museum of contemporary art in our own neighboring Rust Belt city, Cleveland. During this time, Zerapolo moves seamlessly and sharply through modes of inquiry and production, through writing, building, teaching, and leadership. And I'm just say something briefly about each of those. It's been suggested Alejandro's early writing inaugurated a materialist critique that departed from the critical theory of the 1980s, influenced by complexity theory and the work of American design theorist Jeff Kipnis, Sanford Quinter and Greg Lynn. He remains a prolific writer, publishing, and this is according to my cursory Avery search this afternoon, over 40 articles and essays since 1989, including a most recent one that intrigued me, Patterns, Fabrics, Prototypes, and Tessellations, where he argues that patterns have cultural and political possibilities far beyond decoration, enabling new practices to address some of the crucial problems posed by globalization, including the dichotomy between tabula rasa and contextual thinking, and the articulation between the local and the global. Through a two-part essay in the journal Log that many of you know of, uh, entitled The Politics of the Envelope, uh, which will be a conversation uh, session in Princeton's lecture series early next week, he examines the building envelope as a reflection of technical, cultural, and political issues. Alejandro has published extensively as a critic in professional magazines worldwide, including El Croquis, mm -hmm. Quaderns, A Plus U, Harvard Design Magazine, and has contributed to numerous publications, such as The Endless City, curated by Ricky Burdett. Foreign Office's building projects are known for fascination with form and material, shifting through scale and amongst domains of urban design, architecture, and landscape. In a sequence of projects that has preoccupied me are those that design critic Bob Somol calls the first to extract and translate successfully the possibilities of landscape through the problematics of architecture. In their 1999 competition scheme for Downsview Park, the park's form is determined by the operation and intersection of its systems, providing a flexible infrastructure for change and adaptable use. Towards that end, the scheme evolves by the reorganization of topography into <laughs> circuits and ridges that accommodate seemingly disparate uses from wildflower meadows to extreme sports. In Yokohama, building as object is suspended in favor of what has been called the thick 2D, a ground configuration replete with terminal uses and urban park, maximizing possibilities for urban interface in a section that is woven, not stacked. And a few years later, in Southeast Coastal Park in Barcelona, 2004, topographic manipulations guide both views and flows of people, protect from coastal winds to enable vegetal and human livelihood. The generative concept of dune morphology sponsors both diagram and detail, 
where a custom set of tiles laid in bifurcating rhythms and set in various inclinations sponsor vast programmatic potential. This hardly needs saying that the work of Foreign Office, uh, those mentioned included, have been widely published, ex exhibited, and awarded. Uh, the office was repre represented Britain in the Venice Biennale in 2002. Finally, in addition to his theoretical and built contributions to our discipline and profession, Alejandro has a critical voice in architectural education. Dean of the Berlaga Institute in Rotterdam until 2005, he now occupies the Berlaga chair in the Technical University of Delft. Prior to this, he was a unit master at the AA in London and a visiting professor at institutions internationally, most currently uh, as a visiting professor at Princeton. Most important, perhaps, is the role he plays as architecture's advocate outside our institutions. He's currently a member of the Urban Age Think Tank at the London School of Economics and advisor to the Quality Commission for Architecture in Barcelona and the Committee for Urban Development in the City of Madrid. <laughs> on a personal note, I've had the pleasure of meeting Alejandra on only one occasion, this fall during the Delphic Games in South Korea. Although he didn't pick our scheme as the gold medalist, I did experience later in the evening a greater prize, and that is Alejandro sings a mean karaoke. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Alejandro Zero Polo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. I was going to make the same joke about you. <laughs> the, last, the last time I saw you, we were singing karaoke at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> OK, so the, the uh, presentation tonight is, is a very long presentation. It's a kind of uh, compendium of uh, uh, reflections uh, made in the last few years in the work of, uh, of FOA. Uh, and other uh, inquiries that of a more theoretical, uh, more theoretical nature that I've been uh, doing and, and that I am now trying to develop uh, in in my visiting professorships in 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 Princeton, <coughs> and it uh, is titled envelopes. It relates to the articles published in Log. Uh, uh, and is basically my current uh, line of uh, of research. The lecture is is very long, so if uh, at some point it gets too boring, just uh, tell me to shut up. And I never know how to finish lectures, so they all always uh, die out of uh, sudden death. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the, the the investigation comes out of uh, a reflection. Uh, it looks as if the screen is not picking up the the full. Yeah. <coughs> anyway, maybe I, 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 is this uh, good enough to, to talk about it? Uh, the, the investigation comes out of a reflection that I started um, a few years back that um, was uh, aimed, thank you very much, was aimed at, uh, at uh, trying to regain something that I, I think the people from my generation, Julia was just saying, the generation of the early 60s, uh, uh, I think largely had abandoned, which was the, the, the idea of uh, architecture as a, as a political activity. I, I remember uh, in my early days of teaching uh, uh, completely denying any sort of political engagement or political uh, um, uh, content of uh, the practice and, and uh, recently I've uh, become interested in retrieving part of that uh, content and, and the, the, <coughs> the envelope work uh, is uh, uh, in a way uh, an attempt to find a domain where uh, where we can talk about architecture but where, where we can also talk uh, about uh, politics in a very concrete manner. I, I think that one of the, the, the greatest uh, potentials that uh, architects have uh, uh, now uh, that, um, that uh, politics worldwide are shifting towards um, swing electorates and uh, uh, type of politics that are no longer about uh, party alignments and things like that is precisely to uh, retrieve a certain uh, 
uh, agency that, uh, that we have been deprived of uh, <clears throat> by starting to talk about architecture and reflecting about architecture in a slightly different way. Uh, uh, and so uh, some of the, this research that I, I have been doing uh, took me to, to see uh, who had inspired the political discourse in the early uh, 20th, uh, in the no, maybe the second half of the 20th century and, and uh, found out that uh, maybe some of the, this is not a kind of exhaustive research, but some of these guys were uh, important in, in setting up that discourse and you can see that there was a certain idea of equality, of equ equalizing gender, age, class, etc., uh, etc. Et <clears throat> and, and, and yet uh, I, uh, I grew up in a, in a time in which the people who were actually uh, determining how we live uh, had no, pol no, no political uh, uh, office, uh, um, and yet uh, I think w have been incredibly powerful at shaping uh, the, the world and uh, shape, shaping the politics, the, the, the power regimes where we, uh, where we um, operate. <coughs> and uh, it uh, is interesting that they have all replaced equality by cheapness. Cheapness is, uh, is also uh, uh, one of the, the, the themes that I am most interesting, interested in uh, now, uh, and uh, in a way, some of uh, also this uh, um, uh, research on the envelope is, is trying to find disciplines that escape uh, from the, um, the position where architects like like myself or the people in my generation have been educated to uh, uh, perform, which is to operate in that uh, uh, upper area. <coughs> Architects uh, uh, in, the, in the past were supposed to make uh, new world views and uh, that, that's where, where the value of uh, experimental architecture was uh, located. And, and I think by, by trying to address one particular issue of the building industry, <coughs> in the systematic manner related to politics, uh, what I am uh, more interested in doing, uh, since this is already a very an oversubscribed uh, uh, club, uh, is to engage uh, in this uh, world, which actually shapes, uh, in this particular case, uh, in, the, in the clothing industry, uh, what people wear, 95% of people <coughs> wear. That's where I think that the political uh, opportunities are, <clears throat> and that happens uh, not only in the clothing industry, which is closer to architecture, but in, uh, in also in the airline world, for example, where we have the kind of glamour of the old uh, airlines, expensive airlines, and the cheapness of uh, JetBlue. I just flew in with uh, Jet JetBlue, uh, uh, which is, uh, is fine. It's much better than seeing it, by the way. Uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, and and uh, what is interesting about, about this is that these people, like, like Sara, for example, the effect that ha Sara has had in, in, uh, in Spain uh, is social effect, is remarkable. Uh, uh, but, the, but in the same way, EasyJet has done a great uh, political uh, um, uh, actions, uh, for example, by declassing the, the airline um, uh, cabin, there are no classes any longer in uh, in this. Uh, so even if these people that I showed before are not uh, claiming a, a political position, a political program, they are having a massive effect at uh, at shaping those uh, politics to the extent that now David Cameron in <coughs> in the UK, probably the future uh, prime minister, British prime minister, is getting the uh, management experts of EasyJet to run the councils, and they are calling it the Easy Council. <coughs> and in return, uh, Ryanair uh, is uh, kind of using political imagery to uh, make uh, uh, propaganda. Uh, anyway, so th this, this uh, kind of uh, blurring between, between, uh, between uh, uh, politics and, uh, and uh, money, uh, economies, uh, uh, is, is precisely the, the, the point where I would like to locate the, <coughs> the research on the envelope, uh, which um, uh, is also a certain reflection on a, on a kind of genera generational uh, concern. Uh, 
uh, I also grew in a, in, a, in a generation that was the, the, the generation that uh, became very early aware uh, of uh, global uh, processes and I used to show this slide uh, trying to capture uh, what David Harvey describes as the, the pillars or the, or the mechanisms uh, of uh, uh, flexible accumulation or late capitalism or global uh, capital which are mechanisms of uh, spatial displacement, infrastructure, telecommunications, etc., etc., mechanisms that allow to move, uh, move people, move goods uh, uh, across the, the, the face of the earth and mechanisms of, of temporal displacement, which is basically credit, uh, mechanisms that, that enable you to advance or delay your financial obligations in time. <coughs> uh, and so we, we grew up in this world where uh, we uh, thought that uh, we could move anywhere, the world was seamless, borderless, uh, and we were very much uh, uh, interested in, in trying to capture that in architecture, this kind of fluid reality uh, of uh, uh, global uh, capitalism. And, and, and lately, <clears throat> what has happened is that those same mechanisms that uh, we have used to construct uh, uh, the world where we live are now used to bomb cities uh, and you all know what has happened with uh, credit uh, systems uh, recently. As, and, and, uh, as a result of that, what, what I started to uh, uh, feel is that actually borders that uh, were something that we thought uh, had disappeared are emerging, re-emerging with a virulence that uh, didn't exist before. And uh, this is the American Embassy in London, uh, uh, protectionism. Uh, so borders are re-emerging. Borders, <coughs> limits are uh, uh, a new problem that uh, at least my generation was not concerned with because we were concerned in embodying uh, uh, flows and embodying uh, liquid forms. And Yokohama is very much a, a, a kind of a, a exploration in that in that uh, uh, sense. <clears throat> and so, and, and there are other other issues why limits are becoming uh, important. Uh, the, the planet we are realizing that the, the planet resources are finite. Uh, we know that we are uh, walking towards the abyss uh, uh, if we continue consuming the amount of energy we are consuming and, and uh, producing the carbon emissions that we are producing. <clears throat> and actually, most of these things are resolved, are addressed in the problem of the envelope of the building. Uh, uh, basically, the, the envelope of, of the building accounts for 70% of of the possibilities that, that, that you have, or not 70, I say 70, but, but for a very large percentage of the possibilities that you have uh, uh, to uh, regulate the energy exchanges between uh, the outside uh, of the building and the inside of the, of the building. That's uh, uh, why <coughs> I also thought that this other new consciousness was adding even more reasons why if we want to be relevant uh, uh, in the next few decades, the key issue that we need to uh, investigate is the issue of the of the border, of the envelope, of the limit of the uh, of the building. Uh, and so we we have to come to terms with the fact that we don't live in a borderless world. What is happening now is that the world. Uh, is systematically reconstituting borders. They are no longer the old borders, but they are new, new borders, and we need to uh, uh, determine them. So that's uh, why I <coughs> propose this uh, uh, experiment of trying to develop a, a new a theory of the, of the envelope that basically uh, uh, comes to uh, say that if in the past architects were uh, primarily using the plan and the section to make their political stance, and the, the panopticon or the, or the <coughs> piloti and the plan libre uh, are a very good examples of how uh, architectural devices were at some point invested with uh, political uh, content. 
uh, I think that in the, in the next few years, we probably need to uh, bring together theories of uh, representation and uh, um, uh, technologies of uh, 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 environmental performance into a new theory that, that can bring those two things uh, together. <clears throat> and uh, as a hypothesis, which is, uh, uh, is obviously a test, it's not, uh, it's not a finished uh, theory, what I am trying to do and what I'm going to use as the, as the backbone of the, of the um, uh, exp exp explanation of uh, uh, our projects is uh, uh, the idea that um, envelopes, envelopes, I mean, there has been in the, in the last few years also a lot of interest in the, in the field of architecture about the surface as a problem. Uh, and by talking about the envelope rather than uh, talking about the surface, what I'm trying to do is to uh, expand that, that definition. Uh, uh, I'm not concerned with the patterns uh, uh, of the surface or how to produce the patterns of the surface. I'm not concerned about <coughs> the, the uh, surfacial effects that we can produce. We know we can produce these things. I think what is crucial to address is the relationship between those patterns, those systems of construction, and the, the, the massing of the buildings, the aspect ratios of the building. So the theory is that we can actually draw links between, <coughs> uh, between the aspect ratio of an envelope, and I'm talking again as an envelope, as the sum of the facades and the roof. Uh, uh, another one of the things that has happened is that uh, 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 right now, building technologies are treating facades and roofs in increasingly in a more similar way. So uh, try to theorize the envelope <laughs> by keeping that separation, I think, is, is, uh, is probably not the, the right way to, uh, to address it. And, th and that's why I'm, I'm looking at the buildings as enclosures, enclosures that uh, de mm, contain certain potentials that have to be uh, explored and can be related between the, 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 the way we treat the surface and th this aspect ratio uh, uh, of, of, the, of the enclosures. <coughs> so there are, there are four types that I call flat horizontal, and this is, this is basically my hypothesis, and probably it's, a, it's an incomplete hypothesis, it need, needs to be developed, but that's where, where I start uh, from. Uh, there is uh, flat horizontal envelopes, uh, flat vertical envelopes, spherical envelopes, and uh, vertical envelopes. And those are the four basic categories in which I'm trying to uh, uh, structure this uh, theory of, uh, of the building envelope that hopefully will, will bring together uh, surfacial concerns with uh, uh, climatic uh, problems, with uh, uh, representational uh, problems, and, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, political <coughs> uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, so flat horizontal envelopes are envelopes like this one. Uh, 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 they are not uh, new in the history of uh, architecture. They have a very long uh, tradition, uh, sometimes a utopian. <coughs> uh, uh, so all these uh, buildings that, uh, that uh, contain large spaces and that basically cover a large piece of the ground uh, uh, have also certain interesting potentials. Uh, the most important ones are that because the roof suddenly becomes the main surface of the envelope, uh, it needs to be articulated in such a way that regulates uh, uh, light and ventilation uh, uh, and, and in some ways conditions the interior of the, of the space is the, is the roof that becomes the main device to relate outside and, and inside natural and artificial uh, uh, <coughs> uh, and, and, and what is interesting as a, I think as a, as, a, as a perhaps political opportunity is the, the, the fact that these buildings are usually so large that sometimes or very often uh, even if, uh, if uh, in, a, in a picturesque manner they uh, they have to decide whether nature is inside or outside. And it's very, I mean, it's very common, you go to airports, you go to shopping malls, and there is some attempt always to replicate nature inside. 
by putting bamboo gardens or <coughs> these kind of uh, uh, little demonstrations of nature that you find inside of the airport. So the, 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 the roof is making the border between the inside and the, and the outside, <coughs> but it's also making uh, uh, certain statements about uh, uh, the artificial and the, and the natural. <coughs> and it gets even more complex when these buildings <laughs> become so large and the technologies of uh, roofing become also naturalized uh, 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 that that uh, these uh, buildings start behaving as a as a as a as a ground and and therefore open another uh, i think political potential which is the the, the, the manipulation of the ground the destabilization or restabilization of the ground as a political opportunity uh, because uh, these uh, type of buildings are um, uh, uh, have a very important function inside, they usually have a very low level of determination uh, of the vertical edge. So there is basically nothing that we can do as architects other than, than you know, adding a, a billboard or changing the color of the things to make it look as if we have done architecture. But basically there is neither climatic performance that is very relevant in that peripheral wall uh, uh, nor uh, any attempt uh, to relate between inside and outside because actually what, you are, what these buildings are of, often trying to do is to uh, contain something that is self-contained uh, and, and as detached as possible from uh, the outside. So <clears throat> two projects from the office to uh, uh, talk uh, about this issue and, and I would like to say that um, I'm using the projects of uh, uh, the work of the office to, to, to uh, explain uh, this, but I don't want you to think that they are uh, uh, exemplary in any way. They are probably the indexes where I've been able to identify those potentials. Uh, uh, and, and maybe there are timid attempts within the, the limits of, uh, of the, the projects to address some of these issues. Uh, this is a, a shopping center finished in Umranje uh, in Istanbul two or three years ago uh, in this location and in the, on the Asian side, uh, infrastructural uh, uh, not uh, next to IKEA. Uh, you know, IKEA is the is the the prototype of the flat horizontal uh, envelope, the most in, ma most paradigmatic uh, uh, example of the flat horizontal envelope, which is this kind of abstract box that is deployed onto uh, the ground with no attempt whatsoever to mediate with uh, with the ground. Uh, uh, and with no attempt either to uh, produce any any relationship uh, uh, between the inside and the and the and the outside. And so, in a way, this project became a, 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 an exercise to criticize the status quo of these uh, uh, these uh, blank uh, boxes. That's the that's the ground before we we made the building. Uh, that's uh, the wall, the party wall of IKEA. <coughs> Uh, and, and what was interesting was to, to realize that the, the ground was basically uh, uh, clay, was red earth. And, and, and then looking at uh, old pictures of Istanbul, we realized that Istanbul is a, is a city of uh, 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 green and red uh, because of, uh, it's, it's a very green city. It, it has this kind of clay uh, ground. And, and if we were trying to um, challenge the status quo of this um, uh, deployed box uh, uh, on the on the land. Uh, perhaps one of the possibilities uh, uh, was actually to become uh, to use the palette of the ground to merge the project with the with the ground uh, in in the way in which um, IKEA doesn't do it. And by doing so, uh, uh, hopefully, try to destabilize the ground to to make something. Uh, uh, new uh, of this ground that IKEA also doesn't doesn't relate to doesn't doesn't destabilize or or stabilize or or does anything it, the ground is, is irrelevant so here is it was a, pr a, a a problem of using the envelope to to uh, produce that that new ground we propose a, a green uh, it's a super green building uh, we we managed to convince the client to to split it into pieces and have a, a central uh, square 
Inside, uh, we use a green roof uh, that is obviously ha has certain advantages in terms of uh, uh, thermal performance and, and uh, hydraulic uh, cycle and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and so the, the building that we uh, developed uh, as opposed to what IKEA does, this is IKEA and this is our building. So what we did was to blend the roof and the ground and, and locate this uh, uh, central uh, public space that in the future, once the city grows around this currently suburban uh, location, it could actually become a new uh, square for the, <coughs> for the community. Uh, not, I'm not going to explain the, the but so you, you see the, the palette of materials, a very rough building. We, we had a, uh, a minor uh, uh, engagement with the, the construction. But that was also part of the, the, the problem. We had to set up a very simple uh, set of requirements that will have the effect that we were trying to achieve without having to be on top of, uh, of it very much. Uh, and so these are some of the pictures. It's horribly built, uh, <laughs> therefore, but, but, uh, but never mind. I mean, the, the ideas, most of the ideas are, are there, even if the details are usually uh, uh, crap. I think that's also... Uh, about talking about cheapness, uh, how to operate with uh, these cheap opportunities that, that I think constitute today 90% uh, of, of, uh, of uh, or 95% of the work that architects have and are uh, taking as irrelevant uh, uh, endeavors because they are not uh, expensive, they are not uh, well considered. And I, I think actually those are the, the places where, where we can make important uh, differences, uh, daylight and natural ventilation are used also as a way of <coughs> shaping the, the landscape in the roof. Uh, I mean, not not uh, you see this this uh, this is uh, what the way that the building feels. Uh, these people don't know, but they are walking on an unstable ground. <laughs> uh, uh, and and actually, uh, uh, what happens inside of the of the square? is quite remarkable because uh, suddenly it becomes a, a stage for different activities that are organ organized by, uh, supported by the, by the developers. <coughs> Second project is a project that we are uh, doing now. Uh, it's also a, a cheap project. Uh, is the, the redevelopment of this building, which is Birmingham uh, New Street uh, Station. Uh, in right in the middle of uh, Birmingham is, a, is an old building from the 70s that is being uh, now revamped uh, uh, at a huge cost uh, and uh, at the cost of 390 million pounds. Uh, but our commission, and that's why uh, I say th this could be a fantastic project, uh, a, a, a kind of a civic pride and all these things are obviously in the, in the menu, but the commission that we get is to design the facade to make some kind of image uh, for a refurbishment that is actually being done by another uh, architect. So from this 390 million, we have more or less 40 million. Uh, uh, but this 40 million is where, where uh, the image of the, the, the building uh, uh, has to be located. So uh, it, is, it, is, it was a very difficult project to, uh, to address because it's a as you can see, it's a blank building, uh, 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 and in fact, it has a shopping mall inside, and we were explicitly told not to try to, to make any connections between the inside and the outside. The shopping mall had to remain there, working uh, as it was, and nobody wanted to be disturbed with, with the application of this new uh, <coughs> uh, envelope. Uh, so, so we started thinking, so how, how do we, so normally architects, when, when we do envelopes, we try to communicate in, inside and outside and, and express certain things about that communication. But in this case, that communication was forbidden <laughs> from day one. Uh, so we started thinking, well, what can, what can we do? Birmingham is a city that is like a hub city located in the, in the, in the, in the Midlands uh, uh, that uh, emerges out of a, of a uh, uh, crossing of paths and, and canals uh, and this kind of density of flow and, and the station is obviously uh, a part of that uh, that flow uh, but so what, what we what we uh, 
uh, thought was that maybe we should celebrate the, the or we should use the station as a way of uh, celebrating uh, this quality of Birmingham as a flow city. And there were a number of things that are happening in, in the center of the city that we could use to mobilize certain uh, identities, both of Birmingham and uh, New Street Station. The clouds, Birmingham used to have a famously black sky because of the steel industry and the generally bad weather. Uh, uh, and now it has a beautiful sky because there is uh, global warming and uh, the steel industry has moved to Korea. Uh, so it's a time to celebrate the sky. Uh, uh, it's a time to celebrate the trains that are sunken underground and invisible. It's a time to celebrate the, 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 uh, the lights, uh, the, the lights, uh, the information lights. So we, we basically devised this, this kind of uh, quadritico of... of flows that are happening on the side that we try to uh, capture in, the, in this new uh, scheme. The trains, the, the crowds of uh, commuters going in and out is one of the busiest stations in, in Europe, the bands of information and the sky. And uh, we do that by wrapping the building with a, with a scheme that is reflective and that is designed uh, to reflect exactly those things, not to reflect the buildings in front, like the 70s buildings, uh, but actually to reflect the sky, to reflect the public space, uh, to uh, <coughs> admit the, uh, the screen so that the building becomes uh, a demonstration and a mix uh, of all these things. We, we like to talk about Koyani Squatsi, no? the, the, the movie, where you see cars moving and clouds moving and you know, processes uh, uh, hap uh, happening simultaneously. Uh, as a kind of uh, uh, demonstration of the energy of the <coughs> of the city, so we we instead of looking inwards from the envelope, <coughs> we looked outwards. We scanned the field around the station uh, with a series of uh, sections uh, that identified the depth uh, uh, from which the building is seen, and you see what happens. Uh, we put the, the people, the different uh, uh, viewpoints, and we calculate the, the inclination of those envelopes so that we uh, reflect exactly the things that we wanted to, uh, uh, to reflect. Uh, so sometimes you have a very deep field, sometimes you have the trains below that you want to reflect, uh, sometimes you have, uh, and so with all these sections, we, we just morph them, and that's what created the form uh, of this uh, envelope that is supposed to uh, represent the, the station and, and represent uh, maybe Birmingham as a, as a city that, that has this particular uh, past, uh, but it's all like, a, like something attached to the building. We are not looking inside, we are only looking outside. I think what is interesting about this envelope and the cheapness uh, uh, in which we have to operate is precisely that that cheapness forces us to invent perhaps uh, uh, an alternative to uh, more conventional types of uh, facades. This is the way, it's, it's actually a huge thing. These are, these are the mock-ups of, uh, of uh, the buildings. It's like 19,000 square meters of uh, uh, stainless steel. And, and this is the, the effect that we hope the building will, will have. It will, it will be almost like a device uh, that will uh, enable the, the citizens to witness and to experience the, the different uh, lighting conditions or the different uh, uh, flows that are going in and out of the uh, station through uh, the day. Uh, uh, some more images uh, about the building and, and an, an animation that tries to explain. You see, from ground level you never see the trains, but it is precisely because the, the facade is reflect and it's, it's pointing down that you see the trains and, and you see the commuters uh, moving and you see the clouds moving and, and you have this kind of uh, synthesis of uh, 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 flows uh, in the center of uh, Birmingham. I'm, I'm not going to finish this. Uh, let's uh, move on to the next <coughs> category, which is the category of uh, spherical uh, trying to honor this, uh, an, an important uh, inspiration in this research, which is uh, Peter Sloterdijk's uh, trilogy of uh, the spheres, <coughs> which I'm fortunate enough to be able to read in Spanish. 
uh, so spherical buildings doesn't mean that they are spherical. It, it means that they have uh, a more or less uh, an equi uh, equidistant or uh, 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 even uh, dimension in all aspects. So the, the height, the depth, and the, the width of the building is more or less uh, the same. So this is uh, a spherical building, this is a spherical building, this is a spherical building, whether you believe it or not. Uh, this is also a spherical building uh, because it has this uh, uh, spherical building in, in, the, in the sense I'm using the, the, the term here. And I think that what is in, uh, spherical buildings has, have a, a long tradition of uh, engagement with <coughs> the representation of political uh, ideas or uh, ideologies primarily because they are buildings that are difficult to function without air conditioning. <coughs> they don't ventilate, you cannot leave them inside, you need to develop a kind of artificial uh, uh, climate inside and that's uh, why they became uh, so rare and, and they are often used as uh, ways of uh, showing utopias or, or uh, worlds uh, in themselves. Uh, spherical buildings have actually the lowest envelope ratio of all because a sphere contains more space per m more cubic meters per square meter of surface. That means that uh, in, in a way what happens in a building like, like this is that the facade is freer from any, determination, any internal determinations uh, than in other typologies, and yet they are buildings that, are usually, that, that usually have a very important iconographic content. They are public buildings, they are buildings that often mix different, different types of spaces. Some of them are not uh, related to the outside. Some of them are, are related to the outside. <coughs> uh, uh, so they enable uh, architects uh, to, or they, they push architects to engage into a kind of experimentation that is uh, to a degree about pure, um, uh, uh, treatment of the surface. The, the surface is no longer uh, a crucial climatic device and therefore it becomes a, 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 a domain for experimentation. And, and so architects now have all kinds of CNC technologies and silk screening technologies and casting technologies that, that uh, are being explored in this type of uh, 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 buildings. Uh, uh, and it's actually quite interesting because I mean, this is a kind of sample of, uh, of all these buildings. What, what you see in all of them is a, is a deliberate attempt to make differentiated patterns. So there is a, there is a certain uh, political unconscious that is, uh, uh, happens in China, but happens in Japan, and happens uh, here in Europe, uh, that uh, drive architects to explore with this type of uh, patterns. That's just kind of a, 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 a side um, uh, comment. Uh, so two buildings that are not that spherical, uh, but unfortunately we, we, we used to have one uh, spherical building, which is the Institute of, of Legal Medicines, but we, uh, that stopped. We, we basically pulled out. That was too cheap to continue. Uh, so, um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm going to show two facades that are um, for buildings that are more or less uh, within that type of envelopes that enclose a space that is equidistant in all dimensions. Uh, one of them is this uh, building, uh, uh, John Lewis. Uh, we, 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 we had to do that uh, project there as part of the development in, in Leicester. Nothing to talk about the inside. Again, cheap projects. We, we don't even, are, uh, we are not allowed to, to question how a cinema complex works or how a shopping uh, department store works because they know better than us. Uh, how they work, so they tell us what to do, and we are left uh, with uh, with uh, the design of the facade as the main area of application of our, our our discipline. So, in that in that situation, we again try to make that envelope uh, attached to. Uh, I mean, uh, attached is a, is a word from Bruno Latour that I like very much because, uh, uh, and, and I like very much in res in in, uh, in respect to the issue of of the envelope because the, the, the surface is by itself, but the envelope is always attached. It's attached to the outside of the building, it's attached to the inside of the building, it's attached to cultural uh, concerns, iconographic concerns, uh, environmental concerns, and so on and so forth. So I in a way, the, the project uh, of the envelope is a project of 
uh, being able to uh, produce or to explore uh, expression of these attachments of the, of the surface. So in this case, Leicester is an industrial city with a huge amount of uh, Asian uh, population and a tradition of, of this type of uh, hoisery. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so what we proposed uh, was to capitalize on that uh, tradition and replace the, the wall of enclosure of, uh, of the, the store with this uh, 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 complex uh, uh, skin of two layers of glass. This, this is actually not, not cheap. <laughs> Uh, uh, but uh, we were lucky enough that the, the, the client uh, bought it, and, and so what we what we did was to use to take a pattern that was from the archive of John Lewis, who was the final tenant for the uh, for the building. We selected a pattern based on the coverage of the pattern uh, because we were interested in a, in a certain amount of G value uh, shading uh, coefficient of the facade in order to achieve certain environmental <coughs> performance and then we redrew it and we redrew it in a way uh, that uh, by having these eight different tiles we can shift the transparency uh, slightly so it's a pattern that uh, appears uh, 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 continuous uh, it's actually discontinuous because there are unitized glazing uh, systems but by printing that pattern on, on the glass we are erasing the, the, the joints and turning it into a monolith uh, that uh, then has a pattern that is differentiated. If you think about uh, that kind of political unconscious that I was uh, uh, mentioning before of facades that are at once uh, 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 monolithic uh, and, and, and differentiated like in Beijing, uh, 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 this is part uh, probably of that same uh, attempt of of capturing that political unconscious. So the, the pattern was scaled up uh, for ergonomic reasons so that it will embrace the heads of the of the people uh, inside. Uh, and it, it has it, because it's double. It has uh, an interesting effect, which is that when you are inside, you see through. Uh, but you when you are so you see through. But when you are outside, you don't see because the two patterns overlap. Uh, and cut the light also. They over, every time that, that the, the light moves diagonally through the envelope, it overlaps every time that it, the light moves uh, horizontally, like when you are looking from inside, uh, uh, you, 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 uh, it, it's more transparent. So that is also some of the effects that, uh, that uh, were produced in this in this building that, that, as you can see, picks up, sometimes uh, uh, reflects, because it's a, it's a, it's a, a reflective um, uh, silk screening, the one that we uh, perform on the, on the glass. It makes, it, uh, it makes the, the, the divisions of the cladding uh, disappears. It captures the, the, the light and the shadow. It makes some areas transparent and opaque, depending on how the light uh, around the building is, it acts as a kind of Chinese lantern uh, at night, changes colors. Uh, uh, next uh, spherical project, project that is now nearing completion in, in front of the dome in Greenwich uh, for uh, a college of design and, and communication. <coughs> uh, we were given uh, uh, a very um, simple shape that was uh, derived from the fact that, that we had to uh, relate to the dome, so we had to either do a crescent or, or a chevron-like form that uh, could be a school but could also be an office building that because of the funding of the project, etc. So anyway, we, 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 we had to do this, this uh, type of, of building. That there are some uh, ideas that I'm not going to discuss about uh, shifting levels, but what is important about this project is that uh, in this case uh, we were we were trying to represent, to capture the identity of, uh, uh, of Ravensworth College, which is a, an offspring of the arts and crafts in, in, in England, William Morris. We had to uh, stand in front of the dome, which is a huge mass uh, with no scale. And so the idea was that what we were going to do was some sort of uh, a silo, uh, 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 wallpaper silo, where uh, 
uh, as opposed to what happens in schools, which is that, that you see always this, the stratification of the, of the uh, different uh, floors, we were trying to destratify those floors, first of all by doing what I showed you before of uh, using a system of uh, split uh, levels that en enhances the diagonal movement uh, uh, through uh, the building and then <coughs> making that uh, pattern of perforations that, that will turn the building into some kind of mysterious mass where you don't know any longer where the floors are located or what, uh, what is happening uh, uh, behind. And we did that by uh, resorting not to flowers but to uh, tile that is derived from, from Penrose tiling non-periodic uh, 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 tiling uh, system um, that uses uh, three pieces, a triangle, a fat pentagon and a thin pentagon, uh, that's how they, they call them, and that uh, covers the, the, the surface um, uh, in this way and enables us to have different sizes of perforations. Uh, and so these are different types of, of perforations. And then, then what happens, you, you see the split level. You see that the floors change. And between two floors, we always have two lines of windows. Because when the floor changes to the split level, uh, suddenly, the, the, and, and so that's the way in which we blur from the facade the presence of the floors that is characteristic of, uh, characteristic of, of uh, school typologies and, and form that very abstract mass in front of the, of the dome. And uh, the, the, what we did here is to uh, identify the programs within that uh, volume and also the exposure to the, to, the, to the sun and use that as a determination of the, the, the size of the windows that had to be used uh, around the, the building that uh, allowed to produce different uh, lighting uh, effects. And so the, what is interesting about this also is that there is a complete, uh, it looks a, a, as a kind of ornamental building, but actually the attachment between, between, uh, between that pattern and the, the size, uh, the floor to floor height uh, and the floor grids is absolutely exact. The, the, the distance of the floors has, has to be 4.594 uh, because otherwise we cannot match we cannot have 180 meters for the low windows when we have uh, low windows and we cannot match the, the floor grids. The pattern in some ways determines the position of the section and everything else. And the pattern changes, as you can see, uh, every time that the perforation uh, changes. Maybe there are better images here. You see when, when the perforation becomes uh, uh, bigger or smaller, the tiles are coded in such a way that that they relate to the polar, the, the center of the polar uh, array. And as the, the things change, the, the pattern around these uh, windows uh, uh, also uh, vary. Uh, and so this is, this is this facade towards the, uh, the dome. And this is the building uh, now nearly uh, finished. Uh, you, you see basically how every time that the window uh, is different, uh, what happens around the window uh, changes automatically uh, colors. This is the atria inside, not going to, to basically, uh, these are uh, the perforations of, uh, of the atria and how the windows appear. The windows appear in, in those uh, perforations. Large facade, <coughs> flat vertical. Uh, I have two more categories. Do I have time, or I'm I'm I'm, I'm like o over the top? <laughs> okay, forty-five minutes late. You said. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, flat vertical. Flat vertical uh, typologies are what is uh, uh, commonly known as slabs. And what is interesting about sl slabs is that they constitute 95% of the typologies, urban typologies built after the Enlightenment. So they are an effective floor or bay depth that uh, optimizes 
uh, daylight and ventilation for a particular use and then they are uh, densified and that's why they produce slabs or bent slabs or these kind of organizations that we know uh, uh, make uh, the cities where we, where we live as opposed to the old cities. Which is the, this is uh, Le Corbusier uh, uh, drawing that, that talks about how those uh, patterns of flat vertical organizations uh, unfold into, into new future organizations that I think is qu quite interesting uh, to explain the, the concept. One of the most important things about this uh, typology is that uh, uh, it, it has that very important urban um, uh, performance. And this is uh, Toulouse-Lemirail, uh, uh, a city that was built, it was a major disaster in the outskirts of Toulouse by Candidis, Josic, and, and Woods, where, where you see, as opposed to what we, what we were seeing in, in, in Barcelona or in, uh, I don't know, in Buenos Aires, and in the traditional cities where the, the flat envelope is delimiting private and public, in, in these modern cities that the Corbusier uh, starts, there is no longer back or front or public and or private. The ground in this kind of welfare state has become all pervading, is all public, uh, and therefore there is no point on, of establishing those uh, differentiations. And, and so in, in the way in which these uh, typologies are deployed onto the ground, uh, we can produce incredibly uh, important uh, effects. So there are other examples of this. Uh, typologies in, in action also failed, perhaps because uh, uh, they failed to uh, make something that uh, was seen as anti-democratic when these, these things were, were built, which is to, to, to accept that it's important that in cities parts of the ground are private. And so in, in being able to establish the patterns in which we deploy these, these typologies and we use them to divide public and, and private, uh, uh, I think there are some of the most impor important potentials of these typologies. The other important potential <coughs> uh, when we talk about uh, politics is that uh, in, in this uh, typology, the envelope, as opposed to what was happening in the, in the spherical uh, uh, types, it performs at the same time very important environmental uh, functions and very important iconographic or representational functions, and both coincide in the, in the envelope. So uh, shades, types of fenestration, and, and so the, the, the history of architecture is full of examples of how uh, the, the flat vertical types represent cells or a, a kind of um, uh, building built by accretion of uh, units or uh, as opposed to that, uh, build, uh, an envelope or a or an, uh, building built by, by uh, repetition of uh, building uh, components uh, that uh, gives priority to that surfacial uh, uh, entity. And, and again, we, we go back to um, these uh, uh, contemporary uh, attempts to deal with the, with the, uh, with the problem. Uh, and uh, you see that as opposed to these Messian and Corbusian types in which everything was me being repetitive, that also, uh, as, a, as this kind of political uh, unconscious, contemporary political unconscious, is not no longer possible to make a building like this. It's just politically incorrect. You are, you are seen as a as sort of a fascist because you are equalizing everybody. And so now uh, uh, all architects are trying to change something so that, that there is some kind of... Uh, and so the, 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 the way in which uh, we uh, uh, manage the relationship between that uh, latent uh, unconscious uh, desire of differentiation uh, as, a, as, a, as a quality that we all aspire to in our uh, contemporary societies and how uh, this differentiation fits into programs that are usually quite repetitive is, is actually <coughs> quite interesting. So in, in this sense, I, I, I bring, again, two projects. This one made in the outskirts of uh, Madrid uh, for social uh, housing, where we were giving the, the, the freedom to 
locate our building in, in that uh, site, and there was uh, supposed to be a park. So we decided to concentrate all the mass in one bay, in one bay uh, facing the park, uh, so that uh, and make all the units uh, uh, through units, so that on one side they will look onto the park, and on the other side they will look onto a private park that that is the the cover of uh, the parking. The, the building uh, was limited to, to a certain height and that immediately took us to a very deep building in order to locate or to host all the, all the units in that uh, front. And once we did that, we realized that because we had a very low facade ratio, we could perhaps think of, in the possibility of making an all-glass social housing building. That was the, the kind of idea that, that we started with, which was this thing. But then, then we realized that in Madrid, in a kind of east-west orientation, that was going to be an oven. So we decided to cover it with a scheme that will uh, contain a buffer zone uh, of terraces. You see that all the typologies are through, uh, enjoying the, the private park and the public uh, park, but also producing cross ventilations and, and producing this kind of tubular units that have very small facade. It's almost as if a, a conventional uh, social housing uh, facade, we had concentrated, packed all the windows in one area and stretched the, the type so that we have only windows on two sides. That's how these typologies uh, are uh, created, always double aspect, etc., etc. Uh, and so this is the, 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 the kind of invention, which is this uh, folding uh, screen that uh, we derived from uh, some local traditional prototypes of uh, solar uh, shading uh, devices uh, and, and that uh, at some point we thought it would be an interesting idea to use uh, bamboo, to use uh, uh, a, a very cheap material to uh, instead of using zinc, perforated zinc, which is what we or originally thought, we convinced the client to use this. <coughs> and so that's how this uh, uh, solid block uh, with uh, folding uh, screens uh, work. And, and you see the, the, the conventional typologies trying to differentiate. Uh, I think what is interesting about this for me, or the, the achievement that I see uh, here, is the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, producing that differentiation, but not by uh, forcefully painting uh, things with a different color intro or introducing interesting details to uh, make uh, that uh, the, 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 the expression of the, of the building, but, but using the, the environmental uh, uh, desires of the different inhabitants inside of the building uh, to produce this varying uh, uh, pattern uh, and yet consistent in, in its uh, nature and its uh, detail. This is how these galleries uh, work when they are closed and when they are open. Next project, uh, um, uh, also part of the kind of uh, flat uh, horizontal office complex in, in the city of uh, London. Uh, in this uh, uh, location, very disorganized fabric. Uh, uh, basically, the, 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 the client told us to make three central core office blocks that were limited uh, in height by view corridors and other complex regulations that we have, in, uh, we have to endure in, in London. Uh, uh, this is the, 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 the first uh, uh, default extrusion of the site into these three buildings and then uh, the chiseling of these extrusions in order to uh, uh, allow more daylight to the neighboring uh, fabric or self-protect uh, the facades to the south. A number of uh, 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 manipulations of those uh, basic extrusions that we went through and then we regulated by the fact that we, need, we, we knew that we needed to use a, a unitized glazing system or facade system uh, to wrap uh, those envelopes and, and the, 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 the possibility of making integer numbers uh, uh, or integ integer cuts of, uh, of those uh, units is what finally fixes the geometry of, uh, of those uh, envelopes that have this kind of curious gem-like quality and that therefore uh, we needed to build in, uh, this, these are the buildings, this is kind of totally conventional central core buildings. Uh, 
uh, but we basically needed to uh, use uh, gla glass uh, in order to have this kind of gem-like uh, quality and uh, glass has the problem that it, it is not uh, very environmentally uh, conscious and efficient and, and so we started researching on how to shade the glass and use the shading, the kind of environmental performance of that uh, facade in order to uh, produce the, the or one of the important uh, architectural expressions of the building. So these, these um, uh, uh, surfaces, these irregular forms were studied by our environmental engineers and we were given different percentages of shading that we had to uh, provide. And then with, a, with an integral number of uh, tiles uh, that were uh, fritted uh, uh, depending on the pattern that we wanted to, to achieve, we could produce these uh, gradated uh, uh, systems of, uh, of uh, shading uh, around the, the envelopes. And this is how the buildings will uh, look like when they uh, come back to the market because at the moment they are on hold. And it's an atrium. I mean, nothing, uh, maybe uh, what I brought is, I don't know if this is going to work. No. No, sorry. This is, this is quite an interesting animation of this. But, but let's move to the last typology, which is the vertical uh, uh, type. Uh, vertical type uh, is interesting, I think, in terms of political uh, effect, because uh, it uh, uh, is the typology that has the most important uh, presence as a kind of uh, iconography or image. But at the same time, it has also the most stringent um, the most stringent uh, uh, requirements in, in terms of environmental performance. These are expensive buildings, buildings that need to be uh, uh, that are expen that, that need to be very carefully measured. Uh, so at the same time, you have this incredible political opportunity on the, uh, uh, to express uh, a certain even national program, like in the case of these buildings. That is um, uh, North Korea, Pyong Pyongyang. Uh, uh, so, so I mean, you, you have this this kind of uh, uh, situations where where uh, you you see a very efficient form then being clad I I with an image, and and that relationship between the image and the environmental performance is, I think, what is most interesting. Environmental performance. This is Hong Kong, uh, where the envelope is actually not trying to be. Icon, iconic or iconographic in any in any sense is, is the the pure uh, uh, embodiment of, of uh, efficiency mm, uh, efficiencies of uh, daylight and, and ventilation every room has to be ventilated every room has to have daylight and therefore you end up in this incredibly uh, complex uh, uh, envelopes that that have a certain performance and that's how they are they are organized so between those uh, buildings and these buildings there is the uh, tension where i think the tension that i think we we can explore as a field of uh, uh, political <coughs> opportunity other other examples of uh, of towers this is dubai so you see between these type of buildings where nature uh, is embedded into the envelope. I mean, the, 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 the interest of uh, Hong Kong and Southeast Asia is that culturally, climatically first, because it's, it's a humid uh, climate that needs ventilation, but also culturally, uh, 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 Asians don't like uh, domestic spaces that do not have a very close relationship with nature, as opposed to Middle Easterns or Westerners, where I mean, uh, high-rise living in uh, in uh, in the United States is about air conditioning and uh, and mechanical ventilation of the toilets and, and pressurizing of the cores and uh, totally artificial uh, 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 devices that are actually keeping the building alive out of consuming energy. Uh, so the opportunity is actually to measure that. Uh, possibility of engaging nature uh, uh, with the building is, I think, also a very important uh, potential of, of these uh, typologies. When, uh, other, other possibilities, uh, shading the outside, 
as a as a determination. I, I think that we, we live in a in a time in which it, it's almost like we can do anything, and actually, what we need to uh, perhaps uh, start to uh, find out is what we should not do. Uh, and and in a way, this uh, research, uh, th this is our own research on envelope ratios, uh, where you see buildings in Korea or buildings in uh, in the UK uh, uh, having. Uh, f uh, ratios of uh, from 0.38 square meters to a square meter of uh, floor uh, to buildings in Southeast Asia where you have 0.84 square meters per floor. That is a number that probably developers and uh, people who are in the bu building industry know very well. Architects know nothing or uh, cannot use them uh, effectively. And, and I think that that is a type of investigation that uh, that I am particularly interested in because they they these numbers express the level of artificiality of the space inside uh, so some examples that that we two examples I'm going to, to explain to quickly two examples of how uh, we have explored in the past the articulation between uh, efficiency and expression uh, uh, as a, uh, as a trying to regain, again, consistency in these uh, typologies that now are often delivered by totally independent uh, 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 professionals. Some people does the core, other does the layout of the, of the floor plates, and somebody else comes and wraps around with a, with a funky facade. So in a way, uh, the, the project that, that I'm interested in and that I am engaged in is, is, is the project of resetting those attachments uh, that will make the envelope perform uh, again not just as a, as a decoration of a, of a scheme. World Trade Center competition, uh, uh, not competition actually, that was the commission from Max Protech uh, uh, and that was our proposal which was uh, to split the, the mass of the uh, uh, two towers into these six towers uh, that had the size of an average uh, lease of uh, offices in Manhattan at the at the time, and bending the towers so that they will buttress each other and and, uh, and therefore uh, hopefully uh, inaugurate a new typology of uh, high rise that by shaping the envelope is more has more capacity to to keep uh, 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 growing uh, higher uh, and and also producing certain uh, lobby uh, effects. But but in a way, it's a kind of envelope envelope used in this case uh, for structural efficiency uh, uh, but at the same time resonating with certain messages that were very much part of what had to be uh, uh, communicated in these in these projects now these images of people uh, uh, building together uh, something <coughs> almost like uh, physically were, were very much part part of the of the iconography that we had to make resonate uh, with uh, with those structural uh, concerns, uh, and uh, the, the last uh, project is a project that is uh, uh, now again on hold, uh, but hopefully start restarting soon in, in KL, uh, a commercial cheap project again. Uh, what, what is what is interesting about uh, 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 this project, uh, and perhaps I, I should have brought others, but. To, there were too many projects, but uh, is, uh, towers are the envelopes that are probably most exposed or most affected by solar radiation uh, because they have a huge surface that is hit uh, by, the, by the sun constantly. Probably also flat uh, horizontal uh, have a similar um, uh, effect. Mm. Uh, so what was interesting about this, this project was that we were working in the equator. And what, when you work in the equator, uh, it's hot and you don't want to get the sun. So the sun actually is moving right above you. Uh, you are, as opposed to what happens in the northern or southern <coughs> hemisphere where the, where the sun is moving around, in the equator is moving above and you don't want the sun. So what ends up happening, this is the, the, the solar uh, diagram. Uh, this is very disorganized, sorry. Uh, what ends up happening is that, <coughs> oh, there are some slides missing here. 
sorry. The, these, these buildings are, are basic. I, I don't know whether there is a, a plan of the buildings. Yeah. So what ends up happening is that you want to have buildings oriented north-south, as opposed to what happens when you work in the northern or uh, southern hemispheres, where you want the mass to be more compact, more concentrated, <coughs> and hopefully oriented to the, uh, uh, to the south. So we develop these typologies as kind of relatively uh, or very conventional typologies uh, in, in KL with the parameters of providing daylight to, uh, and ventilation to every one of the, of the units and, and therefore this labyrinthic uh, type of corrugation of the, of the facade that, that is the direct uh, 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 product of addressing those environmental uh, concerns. But you can see, for example, that the core is open, is not pressurized, is not ventilated, is not uh, ventilated, is mm -hmm. not uh, 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 conditioned, and therefore it doesn't consume energy. The, the, the higher capital costs that buildings that have a more complex facade have in respect to more simple uh, facades uh, actually can, be, can, can, uh, can produce a lower maintenance and a more efficient energy uh, management for the for the building, and that's uh, I think the, the type of, uh, of uh, shading, self shading devices, canopies that are, uh, are uh, designed in terms of uh, the orientation of the of the face, but also in terms of the 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 function of the room that they are uh, protecting, and that became the language that that produces the the expression of the. Uh, of the building, uh, uh, so that that is a detail of how that facade will uh, be uh, built, and these effects of changing in the the, the, the section. Uh, I didn't explain it, but it was at the beginning in a disorganized way. The, the section, uh, the types of apartments uh, change. So in, in a way, uh, that uh, again ambition of a, of a differentiated but consistent. Uh, expression of the community that is uh, uh, inhabiting the building is also very much uh, part of this uh, 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 project. I, I, I am, uh, I, I think, as, as I said uh, before, uh, I think I had more projects, but, but I think that I already told you enough for you to uh, uh, understand what uh, this uh, uh, project of the envelope is and I thank you for your patience and if you want to have questions I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you. Well, you, you know, I, I mean, the, the whole issue of uh, effect is, uh, is very interesting because I, I think that the, 
what some uh, theorists uh, have uh, described that as the as the um, non-representational theory, uh, Nigel Thrift and all these uh, these people are, are been talking about a type of uh, politics that are played no longer on a on a dialectic level, but on an affective level. I mean, uh, what's uh, Brian Masumi talking about? Uh, Ronald Reagan as the epitome of uh, the aff affective polit uh, politician who doesn't really engage in the discourse but but actually conveys uh, uh, a certain message by his by his own presence almost is probably what uh, uh, what uh, would be uh, a clearest example of of uh, of how buildings uh, produce messages convey messages uh, that are almost uh, subliminal, and it's true that in the text of uh, of the envelope of the politics of the or, or the pattern one, uh, for me many of these uh, possibilities are allegorical. I I I accept it, and I and I think that that probably those are the most effective tools that we have as architects. To engage with this type of uh, of politics, uh, when I, I mean, I'm fascinated by the by the fact that all the buildings that were were built for the Be Beijing Olympics were commissioned to uh, very important names, and they all ended up being a differentiated, consistent pattern: the the CCTV, the the, the stadium, the water cube. No matter what uh, uh, architect is operating, is some, somehow receiving the message from the Chinese authorities that they want to portray themselves not as the uh, the in, in the, the uh, heritage of uh, Mao and the blue suit where everything is the same but they want to portray themselves as as a, as a culture that is capable of engage massive uh, projects and yet be sensitive to difference uh, uh, so it is allegorical, but uh, but and, and probably there are there are effects that are produced by by the the the, the pure um, performance of of the facade that that are not amenable amenable to to a, to a, uh, to an allegorical, uh, to an allegory, to an, to an iconography of how the, the society is um, organizing. The, the MVRDB building, for example, the, the MVRDB facade is, is, a, is also uh, a building that is exploring difference, in a way. A, a exploring the effect of difference. It's exploring a message uh, of saying we are, we are free, we are an integrating community, we are welcoming, we are, uh, everybody can do what they uh, want uh, here. So there are all these messages that are being uh, played out <coughs> uh, in a kind of latent uh, manner that, that I think architecture unveils or can, un can unveil. And then there are other, other effects that are probably l less more difficult to to uh, pin down that have to do with a certain experiential uh, uh, impression that that you receive but i i i don't know how to address them I mean, that's why i don't i don't i don't theorize them because when when i can i mean i i know that buildings produce certain effects uh, effects or, or, or of lightness or or uh, an interesting example: the, the the new American embassy in London. Do you know this project, won by Kieran Timberlake a uh, couple of weeks uh, ago? It ha it happens that it, as part of this research on on, on the envelope <coughs> in Princeton, one of the typologies that we were uh, exploring was the typology of the embassy, as one of the examples of the spherical envelope, because embassies have a lot of. Uh, stuff inside that that uh, don't need daylight. They are kind of secret, uh, nearly military places. With uh, and and so uh, they end up being quite fat buildings, quite 
spherical, if, if you want. And so the spherical group did a research on American embassies. There is a manual of uh, how to do American embassies right now that very few people don't know, but, but it exists. Uh, and they found it. And they ended up proposing a, a, a building that was not in London, but it was uh, an, an uh, experiments with the, with the issue of, of American embassies. Uh, and the, the, the issue of touching the ground, the building touching the ground, the building uh, defining its, um, uh, its, its uh, pattern, the pattern that wraps around the building, the way the building uh, delineates itself against the skyline. Those are moments in which you are giving messages. How, how does the American country land on foreign ground? Well, the, the, the students, uh, uh, after doing some research, concluded that the American embassies, uh, I mean, they were gradated. I mean, it's a pity. I could have brought this, uh, this, uh, this uh, slide. Uh, that uh, depending on the level of threat and the level of friendliness between the US and, uh, and other countries, uh, the buildings needed to be have a light touch. That's an that's an effect. That is when when the building is saying things subliminally, without without debating them. But that's also what is dangerous about the, the the effects that are things that are like cocaine. They go straight to 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 to, to the brain. You don't have control of what they do to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so so. Uh, some of these these things you can you can identify, particularly in, in projects that are um, where where effects are, are very uh, very uh, important. Otherwise, I, I I don't know how else uh, to uh, to use the term. I think it's a very difficult term to use. And that's probably why most of the examples that I end up coming up with are either resonances of political structures. So when you see that a facade with a pattern that is repetitive means equalitarian modular societies. Most, most American embassies from the 50s are like that. Curtain walls, screens, uh, so that, uh, that I think that there is a there is a whole uh, thing that you can that you can investigate and, and probably <coughs> here I'm I'm touching it in a few instances. Uh, I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm answering your your question or, or yeah. yeah. The silhouette. The building that is always perhaps the thing that also has to either be engaged or avoided as and maybe the surface is I mean I'm curious how you deal with the two, the silhouette versus the surface. We've seen a lot of yeah. this the, the, the next the, the next project was about the silhouette. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, because the, I mean this was a, an interesting an interesting project. We we, we were commissioned I'm I'm gonna show you because I think it's it's very uh, demonstrative of uh, of this. We we were uh, given the commission of or, or the, the, we entered a competition that was won by Cesar Pelli finally uh, to do the tallest building in in Seville. Uh, the mayor wanted to say, "I'm going to do the the tallest building in this city," uh, and there, there has been in, in that city there has been a, a, a regulation for centuries that no building can be taller than this. 
this was the tallest building in Europe uh, for centuries, the uh, Giralda. Uh, so uh, we were told in, in, a, in, a, in, in to locate that building in in this place. Uh, in this place, I mean, you don't you don't see it there, but there's absolutely no reason why you would put a 50-story building there, financially. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. But that was the commission. Put a 50-story building in the in the Isla de la Cartuja uh, uh, because the mayor wants to have wants to say that he's built the tallest building in, in Seville, and Seville is a modern city. So, silhouette. Uh, we started investigating in, in the silhouettes that constantly, I mean, obviously when you make that statement and you want to uh, relate to the city, uh, you need to say, well, whatever building is there is going to be the new essence of Seville. So we went into kind of iconographic uh, uh, investigations of patterns, brick, flamenco dancing, uh, curves, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, so then, then we we ended up doing a, a, a building that was actually trying to make that that moving uh, silhouette by rotating, rotating a plan that was like a diamond. You see, it was a kind of conventional, conventional office building that we distort and more or less we preserved most of the efficient. Uh, qualities of uh, of uh, space and and then we mediate between these diamonds and that's what basically the plants do ah too many but you are seeing basically as if you're going up the lift of the 50 stories and uh, <laughs> And so the silhouette ends up being like this kind of uh, dancer, unstable, uh, uh, covered with uh, tiles that have to do with uh, uh, with other uh, cultural, local cultural traditions. So I mean I I, I completely agree that the, the envelope in this case is formed by by taking those plants that are that are a derivation of a conventional office plan and do something with them so that they end up producing effects that have to do with <coughs> dynamism, instability, uh, pat the pattern of the, of the dancers with these polka dots, uh, dresses that, that, uh, that they use, the, the, the tiling. Uh, so the, the, all these things I, I think have to do about conveying in this case an image, which I don't know whether it is an effect, an, an effect. is more of, a, of an iconography, perhaps. And there is an effect, perhaps, in the silhouette. Uh, there is an iconography, uh, the use of an iconography of the tiles and, and uh, the polka dot dresses and the, 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 the lattices that, that uh, are typical of uh, Moorish architecture. Anyway, an opportunity to see another project. <laughs>